So my name is Leanne Buchanan, and I'm the uh, founding executive director of Venture Cafe Miami. Uh, we're a nonprofit that focuses on really making Miami a hub for inclusive innovation through high impact programming events. And I'm super excited to have a conversation with Maxine Tuckman, right? Um, who is the CEO and uh, founder of Caribou. How are you doing, Max? I'm lovely. Thanks, Leanne. So we do this all the time, just in like, normal settings. And <laughs> like we just did this in the car, so it's, it's just more public now. Um, so in terms of the run-up show for tonight, Max and I are going to chat a little bit about kind of the entrepreneurial journey, you know, Miami as a city for cultivating high-growth entrepreneurs and creating opportunities for amazing entrepreneurs like her, and then we'll turn it over to some Q&A from the audience. How does that sound? Sounds good. Awesome. So the first to-do that I got from the folks at Endeavor was to ask you about your background, and instead of saying, Max, please give me your bio in 30 seconds or less, I thought I'd kind of mix it up. So we're gonna play a game, you ready? I'm ready for it. Um, it's called Complete This Sentence. Okay. And then you can add additional <laughs> ad libs if you want to. So first up, the city I rep is? Oh, the 305, like that's like so easy. Is it that? Ride or die. <laughs> For the 305. Um, the city I grew up in? Is also the 305. Okay, Miami born and raised. Um, my favorite post-college job was? Working at MTV. Why? So, um, it's actually really, like on the production side, so I was on the production side, it's it's insane. It's like literally like being at war. I mean, there's just a mil it's you're on a live show and there's like crazy stuff happening and artists and uh, talent are upset about stuff. Uh, can I tell a funny story? Yes. Um, so we were doing the Latin American VMAs and um, so it's a live show going on at eight o'clock. Carlos Santana is opening. So I bump into him in the in the hallway like and I'm just like, oh, Hi, senor. And he's like, why is my band eating in a different building? And I was like, well, you have like 900 people in your band and they don't fit in the Jackie Gleason, so they're eating in the building next door. If my band does not eat in this building, I am not going on at eight. Oh my gosh. And I was like, give me one second. Like, <laughs> well, let me see what I can do about that. Um, so, I, like, I think we're gonna get into this, but when you um, are trying to figure out if you think you'd be a good entrepreneur, um, if you can handle those types of situations, uh, then you are going to be an excellent entrepreneur because that is literally, I feel like as an entrepreneur, I feel like Carlos Santana is telling me to, he's gonna hold up my show like every five seconds, so. Um, <laughs> That's a great uh, quote, we'll have to put it on a t-shirt. Yeah. Um, so a little known fact about me is, um, I have a weird obsession with the WWE. Interesting. Did you, did you watch the play um, that was playing at Miami Drama? No, I missed it. I know, I was really excited about it because I was like, I love fake wrestling. And I mean, when you're Latina, you're growing up, uh, like telenovelas are like your favorite thing. And so just imagine like big sweaty men in like little underwear, like doing a telenovela for you. Um, and now there's like a real women's division and they're giving the women, the like female wrestlers, like some real matches and, um, uh, and there's like all these like storylines and I just, I think, I personally also on the business side, I think the WWE is like one, I am, um, you guys have no idea, like do your homework on the WWE, they are like the, one of the most amazing like marketing machines. They get social media and social networks in a way that is like no other company I think can match. Um, and the way that they think about content um, and, uh, is, I, and they also have like a, a base of loyal fans that they've had for like, like 30, 30 plus years. I used to watch WWE yeah. when I was eight years old. Well, right, that's when I started. And then I like kind of got back into it recently, but uh, yeah, I, like it, I think that customer loyalty. So I like love the WWE like personally, but as a like as a businesswoman, I'm always like, ooh, what did they do? Like, how did they do that? Like, well, how can I copy that for Caribou? So it's like a weird little. Yeah. Last background question is, what keeps me up at night is my insomnia, um, a lot of espresso. And then 
worrying about being lost in space. Okay. That's like a legit fear of mine. Awesome. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit now that we know what keeps you up at night. Yeah. Um, you guys are learning a lot more than you should know about me. Those are good <laughs> questions. I would have never like started with that. I would have been like, I have this weird fear of like being lost in space. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna um, talk about some fun stuff. So I have a nickname for you, which you might not know. Um, Is it something you can share publicly? Yeah, it's something I can share publicly. <laughs> okay, just checking. And I call you the pitch queen. Hmm. Because you are a, in my opinion, a master of making a pitch. Thank you. Be it for kind of pitch competition, for investment, for just talking about what you do. I've seen you pitch on many occasions and you're absolutely flawless. So why don't you start by telling us about your vision for Caribou and what it does? Yeah, well, um, so Caribou is an education platform that helps parents, extended family, and mentors to read and draw with children when they're not in the same location. So think FaceTime meets Kindle for families. Um, so it's a shared screen, you can see each other, you can see the same book, you can turn the pages all in real time. Uh, and the drawing feature, you are, like everything you do immediately, the other person is seeing. Um, so we're really helping families stay connected. We're helping children, uh, you know, increase the quantity of time reading. Uh, we have big, big plans for Caribou. Uh, right now, I, I see us as a B2C product that really helps families uh, read together when they're not in the same place. But uh, our technology has so many more applications. There are so many different ways that uh, we can open up different markets. Uh, we're already in 148 countries, but we want to continue growing um, that, that user base. And we have six languages right now on Caribou, but I hope to have many, many more uh, in, in the near future. I did not realize you were in 140 countries. Boom. Wow. Yeah. That's like an exponential increase since we last talked about this. <laughs> so I'm curious, um, and I know a little bit more about your background than perhaps our audience does, but like why, Car why, why Caribou? Why this issue? What inspired you to really take this on? Um, because we hear all the statistics about um, kind of where the U.S. stands in terms of um, access to education, access to opportunities on a global scale. You know, in Florida specifically, we're always talking about how our schools are severely underfunded, which has kind of a ripple effect in society. But beyond that, from a personal perspective, why did you take um, so how many of you know where Liberty City is? Okay, awesome, good. Uh, so I taught there for two years, and I taught 12th graders. And my 12th graders were pretty much, uh, sometimes less, on a fifth grade reading level. And to me, that's just unacceptable. Um, unacceptable personally, and also just as a global citizen, right? The fact that we are allowing children they're not children anymore, 18 grown adults, 18 year olds to graduate from college not being able to read uh, on grade level is uh, atrocious because once you're out of school, especially if you have a fifth grade reading level, you're not going to college, right? Um, and then if you're not going to college, what type of career can you get when you can't even read the instructions on the job application or your uh, credit card agreement or your lease um, or even sometimes a prescription bottle? Um, it's it's I think it's child abuse. I think it's completely unacceptable. Um, and I, I started, like, I, I've done so much in education. Um, I've worked at nonprofits. I've worked at foundations. I've worked in districts. I've worked for mayors. Um, and I just felt like every single time we weren't doing enough and we weren't uh, solving the problem. We, were, we just kept putting band-aids, right? Because there's so, like, my goal in life is to put every single nonprofit that focuses on middle school and high school reading out of business. Because if I do my job right and I have kids reading on grade level by the time that they get to school and especially by third grade, then those people don't have to exist. It's like, I'm not doing it like to be mean. I'm doing it because like, if, if kids are reading, then, then everything's all right. And um, I, I just, I, I kept coming back to, if we just get it right between zero and seven, then we, I mean, the amount of economic, uh, like, the, I don't even like know how to say this, but um, we are, like, we are becoming uncompetitive, uncompetitive. 
non-competitive, thank you, I make up words. Um, I'm a literacy ed tech person who makes up words. That's actually a sign of intelligence. Um, so we're becoming not, yeah. <laughs> We're becoming non-competitive because of the fact that we we're not actually unemployed. Like our our um, our population is not unemployed. We're underemployed. Like we are not giving people the skills uh, or the right type of education to be competitive. And other countries are, are gaining traction on us. So it's it's not just like a nice to have. It's not like a social issue. It's actually an economic issue and a competitive. Uh, this issue so uh, for so many different reasons and then just like my family background like I'm the first one in my family to go to college um, And so I know how much I struggled. I know you know having English as my second language was made uh, the world a little bit harder um, And so if we can just again give parents the tools to help their kids at that really early age um, And just get it right the first time uh, There's there's so many other things that we don't have to worry about so before we get into you as an entrepreneur, like it's clear that you're abundantly passionate about this issue. Um, and I think that's important. Um, if you're not passionate about it, it's probably not going to take off. Can you talk to us about, you know, what are some of the characteristics or qualities um, that would be helpful for someone to have or possess if they want to become an entrepreneur? Flexibility is one that you mentioned with your kind of set kind of story, but what are some other things that are really a hallmark of what is likely to be a successful? Um, so being an entrepreneur is not for the faint of heart. It's it's uh, it's really hard, um, but I love it. I literally wake up every morning like so excited to get to work. And I uh, I was on a call on Friday, and the woman started with Happy Friday, and I was like, What is Friday to me anymore? Like it doesn't even like I don't even know what that like yes, it's a, and now I at least know what day of the week it is because it all just like blends together. Um, so if you're not willing to work 24/7 on your idea, like don't become an entrepreneur. If you like your weekends, if you like hanging out with your friends, if you like making it to family events, um, if you ever want to date or like have a happy partner, um, if you want to keep your children alive, like I mean, so many like so many reasons not to become an entrepreneur um, or things that that wouldn't work out. I feel like uh, there's you have you back to the Carlos Santana story like you just literally have to problem solve on your feet um, if you're the type of person that likes a lot of structure and likes um, a lot of time to think about problems uh, this is not for you um, you literally every every day are, are changing the strategy changing the model changing what you're focused on um, because you are testing you are constantly testing um, I like to say that I like I'm a scientist I am constantly testing things and when I test I either decide to double down on that because it, it worked or I walk away from it I don't fail um, I test and sometimes your test doesn't work out um, but on failure uh, you do have to be okay with like it's hard like I feel like I'm a type A personality so I like I'm a perfectionist and being an entrepreneur you kind of have to like be okay with not so perfect um, yeah so Miami is not Silicon Valley. It's a very different market. Thank God it's not Silicon Valley. Um, so we've got we our pros, we've got our cons, and I want to get into that in a second. But as an entrepreneur, specifically as a woman of color entrepreneur in Miami, um, do you feel like you have sufficient support? If not, you know, what are the things that would make life easier for you? Understanding an entrepreneur life is never going to be easy, but what are some of the kind of support systems, networks, or access points that would make it easier for you if it's not ideal? Oh, it's like so no, much, like so much to say here, yeah. And I'm gonna run off on like tangents, so like hook oh, me back I'll, over. I'll go over Thank you. Um, how many of you have ever worked in Silicon Valley? Oh, so you know. Girl, well, let me tell you. So I, my first startup was in Silicon Valley and I like couldn't have run away fast enough. Um, it's an, it's a like a boys network that's like something you don't want to be part of. It's um, it's a lot of like fronting and and showing off with like nothing actually happening behind the scenes. Like it's and it's a it's a like a race to like nowhere. I don't know. There was uh, I feel like that market is so saturated. Like if you want, I always say if you wanted to build a, a tech company, if you wanted to be an entrepreneur like 10, 15 years ago, like Silicon Valley was exactly where you should be. If you want to be a tech entrepreneur in the future, you need to be in different cities. 
and especially cities like Miami, Austin, Kansas City, surprisingly New York, Boston, um, that are that are building these ecosystems um, because that that market is saturated. And so the right place to be is somewhere like Miami that is is kind of building this ecosystem. I, I always used to say um, I want to be a big dolphin in a small pond, and that's why I came to Miami because I want to I want to be part of like well building the pond but also kind of be leading the pond right um and i think you can do that in miami i think we're still kind of uh building it as as we grow i think um the other um, so on the female founder side or being even just a so i obviously have white privilege um unless i tell someone when i walk in the room that i'm a latina or i'm wearing my hoops or uh you know i'm walking away and they can tell uh that, like people don't know um but there is there is something very different about raising money when you're a woman, right? And um, and we all know a lot of the the really bad stuff about you know the the comments that get made, um, the suggestive uh, uh, kind of gestures, um, the very uncomfortable meeting places that sometimes uh, you're asked to connect in, and uh, so there's that, right? But let's just. Like, we all know what's going on there. Um, but the thing I will say that is probably the most frustrating is the, um, the kind of standards that I'm held to versus a male entrepreneur. So I have actually seen, and there's research on this from, from HBR, um, when a man walks into the room and pitches his company, he is asked all these questions about his potential, his vision, where they're going, what the future looks like for his company. Women are nailed on your current numbers, current like kind of landscape, current benchmarks, um, and and it, it like it's there's there's like it's not just even in the questions. It's about like trying to almost try and figure out like why you shouldn't be funded. Um, it, it's not a great feeling, and also a lot of times there's a perception that because I'm a woman, I don't understand my company. I don't understand the financials. And maybe we should ask the questions of my male co-founder for the financials. Um, so what I did in the beginning when I was first starting to, to kind of talk to investors, um, we put our team slide really, really early. And I made sure that the Harvard Business School logo was really big next to my name. Because I just wanted to make sure that everyone was really effing clear that I understood what I was doing. Um, and that's frustrating, right? Like you don't want to have to kind of do that, but it, but that's what investors are thinking when they're across from the, you know, across from you. And then there's all the unspoken stuff, right? So you walk into a room, you're of a certain age. Am I going to give her money? And then she's going to go get pregnant and have babies and leave the company. Um, and so what, what <laughs> you want me to keep going? <laughs> just kidding. No. And I'd like to like just think through this a little bit. So I think less than 10%, I think 6% 6 of VCs are women, if that. And it keeps going down, actually, instead of going up. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the majority of VC-funded startups are headed by men. I think it's like 97%, if not more. So what are you doing and what should we be doing to create an ecosystem, at least on the investor level, that either looks like us or better represents us, or is more attuned to how to equitably evaluate women funding companies. Yeah. I mean, the, the VCs are the same pipeline that investment bankers and, co and consultants are using, right? And that's why business schools um, are still uh, doing a poor job of in including women. Um, and w so uh, I got to meet um, at, at a conference this, uh, she's like, the f she's the first female coach in the NFL. Yeah, she's like super cool. Um, the reason why there aren't more female coaches in the NFL is because you had to have played to be a coach. And that's how it is in the VC world. Like you have to have run a company and exited to be invited to be part of a, a VC firm because they feel like, okay, well, if you could run a company and exit, then you obviously know what to look for in companies that we should fund. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle that um, unless we are funding more women and supporting them and having them exit, uh, then they'll never really get into the VC uh, kind of pipeline. Um, so one of the things we can do is, for example, Babson Winlab, 
um, is an incredible accelerator. That they're based out of Boston, but they decided that in their for their second group they would come to Miami again, just showing how awesome this ecosystem is. And there's 20 women in this cohort, and we need to support them. Like we need to make sure that they're out there um, again, pitching, um, meeting investors, getting customers, uh, getting funded. Um, and then once we're able to start seeing more females uh, exiting, then we'll start seeing more female investors. One of the things we're doing, how many of you have heard of Aminta Ventures? <gasps> okay, great. Well, I'll tell you. Um, so one of the things that we figured out, so angel investing um, is philanthropy, right? Because you're so early that you're taking a real chance on every company that you fund. And there's a really big chance that most of the companies uh, are not gonna make it. Uh, so in essence, you're, you're giving a lovely donation to some awesome budding entrepreneurs uh, in the space. So what we figured out is that there's a lot of women who are philanthropists. They literally are not looking for a return on their investment. Um, they just wanna do good. They wanna support things that they care about. Um, so Aminta Ventures is focused on educating um, and kind of growing a female base of angel investors from philanthropists. So taking women who are used to, yeah, being um, philanthropic and, and care about uh, the economy and, and business development, like growing the uh, economic development of the city, um, supporting female entrepreneurs, supporting great ideas. That's another huge thing that always frustrates me. Um, I was in a pitch competition with uh, four other companies. One of the other, there was only one other company that had a female founder. She happened to, I knew, I knew her. She's a woman of color. And she is doing pretty much glam squad for ethnic hair, right? So they start talking about their market and I'm like, I'm done, right? Like I'm not winning this pitch competition because like her market is like an inelastic market. Like it's the, the billion dollar market and it's in, like people are gonna pay, like when you have frizzy hair and you live in Miami, like you're gonna pay. <laughs> you are going to pay to make sure that it like gets taken care of. So it's inelastic. And um, so I'm like, okay, I, I lost, I'm fine. So I pitch and then I realize, no, 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 I might actually win this. Why? Because there's four white male judges who they have no idea. They, like they, 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 I mean, you can tell them. Don't get me sorry. Yeah. Like, so, you know, until we change the, who's on the other side of the table, this is like a personal issue for me because if we don't change who's on the other side of the table, then products for women do not get funded, right? So imagine that I'm doing, so there's a company in WinLab, I'm gonna shout them out, um, it's called Imilac, and get ready for it, they do breast pumps um, for, uh, like it's a massager that allows the milk to, to come out with more fat content and it comes out easier. Some of you are uncomfortable right now while I talk about this, right? Imagine being like a guy who's like, I don't know what that is, not, that, that sounds weird, and I'm like not interested, like they're never gonna get funded. But it's something that is going to make women's lives so much easier, is important for the health of babies, and because people don't understand it, um, it doesn't get funded, and that affects women. And so I, it, like, it's, like, it's like a real issue if you think about it. There's so many like childcare um, uh, startups, there's a woman at a CIC, I think it's now called Zing Rides, it's like, Uber for kids. Right? Yeah. Kids yeah. That individuals yeah. And that's like a little bit more palatable, right? But like any femtech, any anything that um, that like, you know, four male investors would be like, oh, I'm not touching that. Like, that sucks. Sorry. All right. So that's my rant. A little bit. Um, beyond actually kind of switching out the fact that the people that are investing are principally primarily male and, and probably white male. Um, I think a lot of it like around narrative shifting. And as you think about Miami, as you think about you know, women of color, women founders in Miami, um, I personally think that narrative shifting happens when we increase the number of stories that show success in a positive light. Talk to me a little bit about maybe some of the things that you have done um, or things that you've been featured in that might contribute to a bit of a narrative shift. Um, maybe is it um, mother invention, like Toyota, um, a lot of disability that you've seen, but like how does that help shift the narrative in Miami around some of our challenge areas? Yeah, um, so I always give Brian Brackeen mad props um, because he was one of the first kind of companies in this ecosystem to, to really make it. 
Um, and because he is a black man, he has an added responsibility to be at every panel and every Knight Foundation event and every Beacon Council event um, because it is so important that people see a black man in tech and doing really well, right? And doing something really cool. Um, and when you are a minority founder, you have this added responsibility. Some of us take it and wear that burden and some of us don't. Um, but for me, that is, and it's tough because like I have a company to run. Like every, like tonight, like I could be doing a million things uh, for my company, but I chose to come here because it is really important that you all see a female founder in tech who's doing something really cool in Miami. And that's how we have to change the narrative. Um, I cannot wait until there's like hundreds of female founders that are doing incredibly well in Miami and I don't have to speak at anything anymore. I think you guys will be excited too. It's like, how many times can we hear Max and Caribou? Um, but I, like that is actually how you change the narrative. And um, we have to be, we have to be really thoughtful and intentional, right? This is something that I think um, I, I constantly am thinking. So for example, I was making a slide today and um, I was putting our, our customer segments. Um, I could have chose, so the first stock footage uh, that you're gonna find on Google are always like white families. Right? And that's fine. And so you can be lazy and just be like, okay, I'm just going to take the first thing that I find. But I specifically like went through like pages of stock footage to find like diverse families to put on my slide. So that's the type of intentionality that I mean when, when you are thinking about putting a panel together. Uh, one of the frustrating things about Miami uh, is, oh my God. Um, it's like, like, do you know that it is statistically impossible to have an all male panel? But we really do a good job of that. Sure we like blow past statistical anomalies like all the time. It's amazing. Like impossible. Women are 50% of the population and it is impossible to not be able to find two women to put on a panel. Yet what happens, so this is, this is how panels get made and this is what happens. So, you know, I don't want to say emerge because that's like a, I don't want to like say that this so happens there. But like, yeah, yeah, okay, an organization. No name. Um, they say, okay, we want to make sure that there's a blockchain conversation happening. So let's put a panel together. So they make, they have someone as a panel maker, right? So I'm the panel maker. I'm a dude, um, and I've got to go find some panelists for this thing. Most people start with their network. They say, like, who do I know that you know knows blockchain? Well, a lot of people end up having a network that looks like them, right? And so if you're a white male panel maker, you probably have a lot of white male friends, and so you are. Uh, kind of looking there and then um, you're like at the end of it you have four dudes and you're like oh sh shoot um, I probably need some diversity <sighs> so then you like find your like one female friend and you're like do you know any any females or like any minorities in blockchain and the person's like yeah, yeah I know one this awesome woman oh good so like they call her and she obviously because she's a woman in blockchain like has 19 other commitments that because she's being asked to be on all these panels and so the panel maker says Psh, well I tried like I spoke to the one woman and like that's why we have an all-male panel because like I, I really tried but so, I think from the organizational standpoint you know Venture Cafe we host a lot of events um, and I want to say 73% of our presenters are people of color. That's awesome. 43% are women. That's awesome. Um, but, it, but it requires, at least on the organizational side, if you ever book a session with us, you have to put the gender and ethnicity of your lead presenter. And we have like this, this little disclaimer that says we're about diversity, inclusion, access, and this is our credo. And if you don't comply with our credo, we're not going to host your event. I'm going to actually like, go through and look and see who the panelists are, and there's times that I will tell our program manager, hey, Liza, can you please call them and tell them to put a person of color in their presenters? Um, so I think it, it requires, to your point, both intentionality and then a little bit of teeth to it to say, look, we just won't host you. Yeah. If you're not going to be diverse, if you're not going to be inclusive, because we can't shift the narrative, we can't create an environment that increases the social capital of more people if we don't have the conditions that are ready to do so. Yeah, and I think a lot of people will fall back. And I'm, I'm, I apologize to any white men in the audience. Like, I'm not like trying to attack white men. It's just you guys are the majority, so you get attacked. Um, and, and again, because you are the majority, uh, this is how power and privilege work. 
right? Um, when you are the person with most power and privilege, you have to you have to give up some for other people to to have some of that. So that's why I talk about it a lot because I just there's a lot of people that just don't even see it, and that's that's okay. Like it's not okay, but. I, I understand why you may go through the world not seeing it, um, but that's why I talk about it so much because I want to make sure that people understand um, our perspective and, and, and how we are navigating the world. Um, but yeah, I think you have to be super intentional. I think, um, so Jason Calacanis uh, was just speaking recently, he's an angel investor, uh, and he talked about um, the fact that before, for his conference, he used to say, well, the only people that are gonna be my panelists are people of merit, and like you have to have gotten to a certain place to be on my panels. Um, and he said, he got to a point where he realized like, okay, I'm holding this standard when the playing field is not level. And so I'm expecting everyone to have gotten the same resources and the same equity, right? Not a quality equity um, to get to where they are. And because that's not level, I have to make um, some. I have to. I have to make some decisions about who uh, is is going to be on this panel. And I think another thing that you mentioned. I, I don't think it's like diversity for diversity's sake, right? It's not like we're like, oh, we need a woman just to like a someone with long check hair, like you have to check a box. Like that's all, don't do that, right? Like we're not saying do that. Um, what we're saying is like, people need to hear diverse perspectives and people need, um, so one of the things that um, I think is important when you're a female founder is talking to other women who've raised money, right? I talked to a bunch of male founders um, and they, they, the way they raise money is never gonna work for me. Right, um, and that's why it's so important to have female role models and to have female mentors because we have just different networks. We have different um, opportunities, different uh, ways that we um, kind of na navigate the world. Um, so it's important to kind of get those examples from from people that look like you. So one of the things I've been thinking about, and I wrote about it this week in our newsletter, is um, Eduardo Pedro, who's at Venture Capital last week. Mm -hmm. Where we literally sit, like we're around the dinner table, and have a conversation with like important leaders in Miami. That's awesome. Crazy idea, and it works really well. One of the things he said was this phrase: "Talent is universal, but opportunity is not." I love when he says that. And I heard that you know he says it a lot. A lot of people say it, but I've been thinking of how that applies not only to kind of our education system, but also how it applies to our innovation kind of community and ecosystem. And I'd love for you to kind of take that and deconstruct it as it relates to your entrepreneurial journey and what Miami has to offer. This is like the thing I love talking about. So I, um, I, so I was on the phone with a, an investor from San Francisco who wants to move to Miami. Um, and she was like, is there any deal flow? Like, am I gonna come down there and have nothing to invest in? And I was like, you are going to have so much to invest in, it's not even funny, because think about this, right? We have pretty much like dropped most of the barriers to becoming an entrepreneur. 15, 20 years ago, I mean, it was super expensive. Computers were like 3,000 times the size, like um, co-working spaces didn't exist, right? The cost to being an entrepreneur, and this is why everyone was in their garages, um, has just kind of been brought to uh, a level that more people can participate. When you think about what an entrepreneur, a good entrepreneur is doing is they're solving a problem, right? Um, and the best people to solve that problem are people that have that problem. And when you think about the diversity in Miami, and I'm not just talking about racial or ethnic, but socioeconomic, um, uh, gender, uh, sexuality, um, just kind of uh, background, right? Trauma, um, all of these things lead to incredible ideas. And when you have such a diverse community, you can't possibly not end up with incredible ideas and incredible entrepreneurs and incredible companies. So I always say, like back to the point of like Silicon Valley is like 10, 15 years ago, um, the, the pockets of opportunity and entrepreneurship are going to come from the most diverse cities because that's where the, the problems um, are happening and that's where people are being really creative and now they have like the opera. So the hackathons that um, are happening with high school students, right? Um, the kids who are learning to code, like there's probably an 11 year old that could do my job better than I can sometimes. And um, so, you know, you're, you're creating these, um, these like 
very like that's why New York um, and and um, and Austin and, and Miami and like all these places that have well maybe Austin doesn't have that much diversity but um, these places where people are solving real problems and again because the barriers are are so much um, easier to kind of jump over I think. Miami is exactly the place where you're going to see a lot more of this innovation. I guess it's the innovation piece is, is the piece that I think I'm most excited about. So I agree with you in part. Okay. You know, over 50% of folks in Miami are born by the country, like I'm not even born in the United States. And so I think like the immigrant uh, yes. spirit mm -hmm. is scrappy. It's kind of a little bit more um, tolerant of risk because you kind of leave your entire country and home and family go start your life anew. But in terms of the deal flow, I would mm. push back a little bit. You know, we're great for startup activity. Number one, I compliment, although I disagree with that number to some degree, because every single real estate transaction requires a thousand different LLCs to be formed, and that's one of the units of measure. But we're like 36 on scale up. Yeah. And so, yeah, we have a lot of great ideas, but do we have the infrastructure and the talent kind of the, the strength of the talent pipeline to really um, produce the volume or churn that's necessary to have those investable companies. We have, I think we have a scale problem, and I want, I want you to talk a little bit about maybe what some of those conditions are. So I hear you, and I think you are absolutely right, and I think this is, I know, this is, this is what you came for, right? Um, I think, I mean, we, we could look at it two ways. One, I think we can look at it as, oh, there's just no resources and no talent. Um, or we could look at it as we're building both sides mm -hmm. as we go. Because there's two sides, right? There's one, do you have the resources to actually build the company? Do you have the talent to build the company? And then there's, do you have the investors to invest in those companies? And one of the biggest issues I see in Florida in general, not just Miami, is that there's a lot of investors that think they're early stage investors, um, but they're not. And then there's a lot of companies that think they're ready for VC money and like don't have a prototype. And um, so there's a, a big mismatch and that's, ha that's gonna happen, right? These are growing pains. Um, so I don't talk about our deal flow like today. I think our deal flow is, is um, it's, it's a drip. <laughs> it's not a flow, it's a deal drip. Um, but it's getting there, right? And I think again, just so um, I moved back to Miami in 2013, uh, which is the year the lab opened um, by a Teach for America alum. Ooh. And uh, the lab was literally the only co. Can, I don't know if you guys can just like go back in time with me four years ago, and like the only co-working space was the lab. Okay, now 2018, we have a pipeline, a bureau, and a WeWork on every freaking corner. Yeah, actually, we have the fifth WeWork opening up, and there are some cities that still only have like zero or one. Um, so that says something, right? Uh, so it's. It's like, these are the predictors of what is to come. Like these are the, the whatever bird that is in the coal mine, canaries. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I was like, some, I was like, yeah, they, yeah, exactly. I was like, is it an albatross? No, that's the bad one. Um, yes, the canary. Uh, so I think that things will eventually catch up. We were just, at, I mean, think about it. We're just at the beginning. Right? New York, Silicon Valley, Boston, they've had so much time um, to kind of build their pipeline and their support systems and their resources. Um, you know, I think the investor piece um, is something that's just happening globally. A lot of investors are going downstream. They're, they're trying to de-risk. They're going for more revenue. They're going for less early stage companies. And because of our ecosystem, we have earlier stage companies. I think the talent thing is a misnomer. Um, and I think uh, especially if you're building a tech company, your talent is always all over the place, right? And um, Miami does have great talent. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to build. Um, there's, I would say there are some types of engineers that we don't have a lot of, that's fine. Um, we also don't have engineers, a lot of engineers that have exited like, you know, big companies and, and now can work for us. And I think the other thing that we're really missing, and again, it just takes time, is companies that have exited and then reinvested in the community. That's the big thing that makes Silicon Valley what it is, is all these people who are kind of like part of this like circle um, and this constant um, kind of reinvestment. And we'll get there. So you touched on something that I'd love to talk about, which is thinking about connectivity. So one of the things that Venture Capital focuses on is not only how we can make this an inclusive innovation uh, community collaboration, um, but really focusing on how we can be in the business of breaking down silos. 
Yeah. And I think a lot of the gaps that we see in our ecosystem between where we are now and what we should be or ought to be are fundamentally caused by the disconnect, like the lack of communication or the expectations not being met on either side of any given relationship dynamic, if it's investors and entrepreneur, if it's government and entrepreneurs, if it's academic institutions and industry. Um, so what are some interesting things that you've seen that are creating greater connectivity in the ecosystem, or at least what are some of the silos that we really need to work on busting down? Yeah. So um, I remember uh, when I was running Teach for America, um, where we, we work with teachers, right, who go into low-income populations and, and teach in schools that have uh, recruiting problems, right? So that's why I'm so glad that so many of you know Liberty City. Liberty City is a tough place to place teachers. Um, there's a lot of teachers that won't go teach in Liberty City for, you know, a lot of uh, assumptions and stereotypes. And um, so Teach for America helps fill those spots. And uh, because we work in a lot of communities of color, we sat down one day and tried to figure out, um, and especially in lower socioeconomic uh, communities, we tried to figure out where in Miami could a really, really rich person be in the same room as a very, very poor person. Um, and we came up with three places. I was like, do you want to guess? <laughs> the beach. Stadiums. The beach? State. Oh, we hadn't Starbucks. thought of stadiums. Starbucks? No. Mm. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Interesting. Airport? Airport was one of them, yeah. So it was Publix? Some Publixes. Some Publixes you'll, you'll never get the two. Um, and then it was Wynwood Art Walk. And Wynwood Art Walk gave us such hope, right? Because it's again, it was really hard for us to like figure out like where, where are these two groups really connecting um, and where are they sharing their stories, right? Because I think that's what builds community and collaboration is when you're sharing your stories and getting to know people. Um, and, uh, and, and so Wynwood Art, Art Walks, like the first place that as someone who grew up in Miami that I could think of where, or maybe Santa's Enchanted Forest, I don't know, <laughs> the youth fair. Um, but Venture Cafe, and this is not just because Leanne is sitting here, I would have talked about Venture Cafe anyway, but Venture Cafe is the second place after Wynwood Art Walk where I have literally seen um, people from all walks of life, again, all different types of diversity, really connecting with each other, talking to each other, leading workshops for each other. Um, one of the things that Venture Cafe does, if you haven't been, you have two days to get your act together. <laughs> because you should. So every Thursday at CIC, another co-working space um, that is just down the street, from four to nine, um, until they kick you out, you get a name, and they will, trust me, they will kick you out. They, you get a name tag, and your name tag says, it has a number next to your name. And the whole goal, and this is like, people in the community really do this. Like it's something like you don't think Miamians do, but we do it at Venture Cafe. You find someone with like a really small number or a large number, depending on which one you are, and you go up to them and you're like, oh my God, you've been here 32 times? Like, what should I do? Like, how do I like meet people? And the person with 32 on their sticker is like, come meet this person, come do this workshop. There's a, an intro session that you should do for Venture Cafe. And like, I have like I probably 32 or something, on, you have like 116. Um, on my sticker and I'll go find people with a one and be like, oh my gosh, welcome. This is so exciting that you're here. Like, what are you looking to get out of it? Who can I introduce you to? Which workshops are you going to? Um, and that's how we build community, right? It's not like we just put people at Wynwood Art Walk and we're like, you know, people of two different backgrounds are like walking into a gallery together. Um, it's really about building those relationships and making those introductions. And I would just say there's like a lot of intentionality around what we do at Venture Cafe. We've seen so over 17,000 people come through on Thursday nights in the last year and a half. That's amazing. Which, when I got the number, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. You're not mic'd for that. Uh, so, but, it, but it's really about, like, if we see that certain zip codes are not coming, how can we do more outreach to those zip codes? If we see that it's too heavy in tech, how can we do more on kind of civic issues? And so one of the things that, that we're trying to think about is how do we then partner with a lot of the other anchor institutions, um, important organizations like the chambers, yep. um, the traditional large bodies that are gathering people together, and see how we can collaborate better with them. We partner with over 353 different organizations. That's awesome. In like a year and a half, 
And I think if more people kind of adopt that model and mindset, we'll have the better connection points, at least in terms of being able to access the inspiration capital, financial capital, and social capital that we entrepreneurs need to grow. And I think, I mean, I think that's, again, why I have such hope for what is to come. Because my students in Liberty City, they all wanted to be business owners, right? Like, they, they love small business. They had a bunch of ideas for what they wanted to do. But no one would come and talk to them about financing. No one would come and talk to them about, uh, you know, building an algorithm or a website or e-commerce. Um, and now with Venture Cafe and the fact that it is so central in Miami, and because it's, I mean, you can get there by public transportation, Miami-Dade College is like right next to it we are giving people the opportunity to learn um, and to be connected to all these different organizations that they didn't even know existed so I have another question but we want to open up the floor for questions anybody else that's here I was kind of like went into like a super diversity conversation and I didn't really talk much about entrepreneurship but I apologize Don't worry, we'll ask questions to you. <laughs> yeah Great universities being part of some cities developing as hubs for, for innovation. Um, How much is that as a, as a fact? It's huge. Uh, it's, I mean, it is why Silicon Valley and Boston and New York are leading the way. Because, um, so first of all, some of the best innovations are coming out of universities, right? Because you have the money, the time, and the equipment to, to do stuff, to research, to test. Um, there's, uh, there's also kind of just like, you know, your, your, all of your expenses are being taken care of when you're in college. It's like, it, it's the best, time, trust me on this, it's the best time uh, to not make a salary. And, um, but I think that's still, I think that's changing, right? So I think that is, that was absolutely right, that makes the most sense. Um, but college is, is becoming obsolete. And, um, and I feel like we're getting pockets of innovation. Again, education has been democratized, right? Like, you don't have to go to Stanford University to take an amazing coding class or to become an, a world-class engineer or to build something yourself. I mean, literally kids in India are getting like computer components and like building their own computers. I mean, it just goes to show that that's not the only way anymore. Um, so that's, again, so Miami is, is unique because we apparently are like number two or three in like college graduates and education institutions, right? If you think about, if you go, I know us Miamians don't like to go past the county line, um, but if you, if, you know, start with FAU, right, and, and move down, I mean, there's like eight institutions between FAU and FIU, um, and like big institutions. What was a statistic I heard yesterday was um, FIU is graduating more students than all Ivy Leagues combined. We have over 250,000 college students in Miami-Dade Yeah, MDC, Miami-Dade College is the largest college in the country. Now, some may argue that the quality is way different than other universities, that's fine, um, but the, the size starts to then beg the quality piece to, to, to really um, kind of ramp up. Um, and again, I just don't think that the colleges are, are the end all be all. I think we're gonna find people kind of making those pockets of innovation outside of places that have world-class universities. And the only thing I'll add is on kind of the Venture Cafe side, we partner very closely with Cambridge Innovation Center. In the expansion that's out of Boston, they look for projects where there's a strong anchor institution partnership because to your point, although traditional formal college education is becoming less and less kind of commonplace, a forward-thinking, super community-engaged anchor institution can really play a significant role in terms of economic drivers and economic impact, in terms of having um, accelerating the growth of innovation beyond the institution and into the broader community. And if it's truly kind of a engaged for the institution, they're also creating those pathways as well to really create what you're talking about, which is you know, anchor institutions fueling more innovation in certain communities. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say that I was it from, uh, I'm sorry. No, no, yeah, please. From perspective, I came from, I worked in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, UK, Australia, and came to Miami because it was cold weather, right? And so 
That's another good reason. Right. Don't so be ashamed I, of that. I was, I was trekking down and I was fearing working here because it has such a bad reputation. This is 10 years ago. And so, and I, as a VP of HR for large corporations, CBS included, when I came here was, you're going to work at Burger King, Royal Caribbean, and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. all these places. Um, I feel like that hasn't changed so much. And I worked in two corporations in Miami. It was a disaster. I don't think they were. But to me, it's the question around. So I decided to become a crazy entrepreneur. Everything you said was exactly right. I don't sleep. I went to an Yeah. But I feel like it's the right thing to do. It's a shameless example. I'm, I connected with Endeavor for that perspective to say, I'm just going to do my own virtual HR thing to be the virtual HR company that's going to offer really cool people strategy stuff for companies in Miami. And one of the things that I decided is, I'm going to keep all the people that have either gone to university here or transplanted like me working here by finding really cool companies because there's so much talent here and I always hear the same thing. I can't find a job, no one will pay attention to me. Um, the recruiters, God bless them. And so for me it's this sort of push and pull of trying to find those really cool organizations which I'm sitting here going, who are these people and how come I don't know them yet? Around finding the people that I should send the talent to because I hear it at, at UN and if I do when I do career stuff, they leave, they come here, they go to university and they leave because it's always the same usual suspects and or nobody pays attention to them, so they're gonna try to have a city. How do you, what do you see the, as a solution in terms of like companies being more um, out there, finding find that talent and, and keeping the talent here? Because it's a, it's the like, sort of right Oh yeah, do you wanna talk about one community, one goal? Oh, I'm sorry, no, I don't know. Okay. Okay, there's, there's some people working on it. Um, I think the I think what what's happening in some cases is um, we're using old methods to to find new people if that makes sense right um, a lot of people like a lot of young people are not putting their res they're not on LinkedIn they're not putting their resume on Indeed um, to find them you've got to either go to the universities or you've got to get on social media um, and like you know. DM someone on IG, right? And you can find some good talent. I think um, talent is also, uh, it's, we're looking, f I think sometimes also we're looking for, so HR, right? Um, there's a lot of people that are now becoming way more specialized because they're not getting the four year degree that's super general. They're getting very specific certificates or learning to code in one certain language or um, picking up skills. And so, I think we have to think about work differently. Um, I think we also have to think about what we're offering people differently. Um, the, the old method, this is why the teaching profession is, I don't know what's gonna happen to it because it's still an old model of like stay for 40 years and maybe you'll make $100,000 by the time you finish. Like who, what millennial is gonna take that job, right? So um, so I think there's like this, this point where we're, we're, we have a little bit of a mismatch. The other thing is that I found um, a lot of big companies don't have the resources to train people anymore. Um, so there's like, some, someone needs to make sure that these kids like know what they're doing before they come in. Um, and, and that's kind of the universities like don't feel responsible, but the companies don't feel responsible. So there's, there's some kind of tension there too. Um, and, and some more work to be done on the company part to really uh, build the skills um, and give that person uh, the experiences that they need. Um, let me think of some more, but you should talk about um, what you guys are doing. What I would add is um, the Economic Development Partnership for Miami Dade College, which is the Beacon Council, has a specific focus on their One Community, One Goal initiative, which is the Talent Development Network. And so it's traditionally been an online portal that plugs into all of the academic institutions um, that are the Academic Leaders Council so that companies can find talent for internships or other um, job experience opportunities from those institutions directly. So you can go to all of them, you know, one-stop shop. Um, and one of the things that Venture Cafe realized was like, people want to interview people, you want to meet the talent, you just don't want to see a resume and hire them, and you don't want to have to go through the process of like scheduling all of these interviews. So we started in partnership with TDN, this thing called the Started Internship Fair. Um, that we do on a Thursday between four and six. We get a couple hundred students who come in and have companies who have internship opportunities available to shut up shop, 
versus there's beer and wine or then there's God. And we found that the kind of matching um, uh, rate is significantly higher than traditional career fairs. So to Max's point, you have to meet this new generation where they are. I'm a millennial, I left like a big uh, firm job and making a ton of money to, to cut my pay to do something really impactful. And so thinking you know, differently about what types of amenities are offered and flexibility in terms of work schedule and location is really kind of this reckoning point that we're coming to. And I think there's a significant disconnect between traditional ways and, and new ways. And so I think the spaces that create um, environments to test and try and new methods of bridging those gaps are important. And I also think that having spaces for dialogue about what are other ways to brainstorm around bridging those gaps, I think is an important piece towards finding the solution. Here's hope. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about, uh, about Caribou. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm a grandparent. Aww. And I have granddaughters who are mostly in Mumbai these days. And we've been using it and love it. So, so that's you know, good news. And, and in the context of, of the really great conversation this evening, Thanks. The two of you, talk a little bit about where you are going with Caribou. And, and I just to be a little bit provocative about it, not worrying that too many of your generation are sort of in it for an exit. Hmm. Well, the mission that you spoke of behind Caribou is surely not about an exit, right? So, and you've done TFA, you probably know a bunch of people that I know in the TFA world, you know, so, so I mean, it just, I can't believe you just did it from the exit. So this is, um, there's something that I, I have, I have a medical condition, um, and it's called investor whiplash. And any of you who are entrepreneurs, she's, she knows exactly what I'm talking about. Every, like, every time I go into a pitch, um, and thank you for calling me a pitch queen, uh, like, I pitch, and the person's like, where's your exit strategy slide? Like, why is it not in there? And I'm like, oh my god, so the next time I have an exit strategy slide, I'm gonna talk about my exit, and then the person's like, you want global domination and you have an exit slide? Like, what is wrong with you, right? Uh, like, you can, so what I have found, um, for any of you entrepreneurs, is you have to have your true north, you have to know what you're trying to do, and you have to authentically project that and talk about it, because if you just build or exit for the investors, um, you, you will go crazy, um, you'll hurt your neck, and you will not build the thing that you want. And so it's something that I come up, with, uh, come up um, against a lot because I always talk about building for global domination, right? Um, our technology right now is helping keep families connected, but um, our technology can be used on the education side, right? There's a, a ton of, of uh, metrics that we can track um, and help kids learn to read. Uh, we can sell to schools, we can sell to coaches, to mentors. Um, we uh, already have people kind of using our technology for tutoring um, and language learning because of uh, the languages that we have. Um, we also see a potential in our, in our technology to, um, to even go into like the workforce, right? To kind of be a, a, a competitor to go to meeting because you can actually work with both screens. Um, but our mission and our passion that I think we'll never walk away from is the fact that we are helping kids learn to read. And we're doing that with a trusted adult and that at the core is always going to be um, why we started the company. Um, we also, another uh, really important piece of Caribou is our uh, commitment to military families. Um, if you think about not only deployed military, but even military that are constantly moving from base to base, uh, I've met so many military families that in 10 years have moved nine times. And if you've moved nine times, that means that you've moved away from family. Um, and uh, so we offer uh, six months free subscription to all currently serving military in the US. And have partnered with Blue Star Families to make sure that all families have access to it. Um, and we'll continue that commitment. Because again, if there's any group of people that need this technology most, um, and, it, and it's truly a lifesaver in some cases, that's, that's our military families. Um, so what I do is I kind of try and, and explain to investors that I'm building for global domination. And for me, the mission is what drives me to, to build for that and, and to have this big vision. 
the reality of it is that I'm running a business, right? And um, if, uh, if someone wanted to acquire us and, we, and it made sense to exit, and now we have investors, right? So it's not only our, I mean, we're, we're still good. We have all the board seats, like it's still our decision, but at some point it may not become our decision. Um, and so as a businesswoman, I have to, I have to think on both sides. The thing I will say though is even if at some point I did sell Caribou, I will be back with another ed tech product um, because like this is my life's work. Um, and I think uh, also I think the other important thing is making sure that whoever acquires you believes in your mission as well. Um, we've also really done that with our investors. Uh, I Back to the point about the investor whiplash, if you constantly are changing your deck and your story to meet the investor, you will never get the right team behind you because what you've been doing is just trying to match up with what they do and then at some point that's not your company anymore because people are making decisions with completely different motivations. Um, and so we've tried to really uh, make sure that no one has come onto the cap table unless you really truly understand like why this is important to us. Yeah, it's a great question, by the We're way. We're out of time for Q&A, but there's more time for some networking. I was going to ask as my final question, what legacy do you want to leave? But you already talked about that. And I know like global domination is really up your alley. So why don't you um, sum up one piece of advice that you have received or wish you had received um, in kind of the new tweet size character count or less? So 280? OK. <laughs> Thanks. God, that's a hard one. It's like a like now. Now I feel like it has to be like really good. It's like the last thing people are gonna remember from me. You dropped so many nuggets, but but one last nugget. What's what's a piece of advice that you received or wish you received? So I'll I'll go with something that I received, um, and hopefully it's helpful to those of you who are entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs. Um, I, again, always wanted to build something in, in the education space and always wanted it to be an early, early education. And so I thought my co-founder should be someone, oh, this is not 280, sorry. Um, I always thought my, it's a threat. It's a, yeah, it's like a tweet one of 17, okay? Yeah. <laughs> This is too long. Um, so uh, I was like, oh, I need an early childhood education specialist as my co-founder, obviously. And I got the best advice ever. Um, someone said to me, it's 20 whatever it was, and they were like, if you do not have a tech co-founder, you are shooting yourself in the foot. An education specialist, you can always hire them, you can contract them, you can have them as an advisor, but if you don't fundamentally have someone involved in your tech from day one who is building something with you and building the architecture of your company, um, it will cause so many problems down the line. And I'm so glad they said that because I do have a co-founder who is our CTO and it, you don't know how many people are jealous uh, of, the, of, of the way that we've kind of built our, our team. So my advice to everybody is just think really truly about, and most of you are going to have tech, but like truly about what the foundation of your company is and make sure that you are building that with someone who, who really compliments you and, and understands uh, that technology. Thank you to Leanne for the great question.